Good evening, everyone, and welcome to today's programme at the Commonwealth Club World Affairs, the nation's oldest and largest public affairs forum. Every year we present more than 450 forums on topics ranging across politics, business, society, climate and the economy. I'm Andrew Dudley, Chair of the People and Nature Forum, and it's a delight to see so many faces in the audience today. I wish to thank you for taking the time to attend this in-person event at our club this evening. A few housekeeping notes, or housekeeping notes. Firstly, please take a moment to double check that your phones are silenced. And secondly, uh, we'll encourage you to ask questions towards the end. Uh, there'll be a, a Q&A section. We'll hand out a microphone. So if you want to ask a question, just please put your hand up. Uh, as is customary for this forum, I'd like to take a moment for us to acknowledge the land on which we gather as the traditional homelands of the Ramatush people. Let's take an opportunity to express our gratitude as guests and to thank the original stewards of this land. As we travel beyond the Ramatush territory, let us commit to acknowledging the first peoples of every community we visit. Now turning to our main event, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce Sergeant Narito Hoto, Biodiversity Supervisor at Akashinga East in Zimbabwe. Narizu grew up in Huyo village in Nyamkate, located in Zimbabwe's Zambezi Valley. Previously a commander of the all women Akashinga Rangers that operate under Akashinga, today Narizu sits as a biodiversity supervisor focused on research and data analysis collected by Akashinga Rangers to evaluate and maintain wildlife and vegetation across the critical landscapes they protect. The Rizzo's excellence as a wildlife ranger and leader in the space has been recognized with honors, including the International Ranger Award with IUCN. And actually you were the first woman awardee of that award. Congratulations. Thank you. The Rizzo graduated from Chinhoe University of Technology with a Bachelor of Science degree in Wildlife, Ecology and Conservation and has plans to pursue a master's degree. As an ambassador of Akashinga, she has travelled across Zimbabwe and around the world, sharing her experience and interests centred on wildlife conservation, ecology and sustainability, and protecting her region's nat natural heritage for generations to come. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to Sergeant Hoto. So welcome to San Francisco, Sergeant. Thank you so much. And uh, I hear this is your first trip to the United States. Uh, how's it going so far? <laughs> yes, it's my first time here and I'm really enjoying this day and had a good experience. Yeah. And uh, you were in Los Angeles. So was it warmer in Los Angeles than here? Yeah, it was warmer in the <laughs> <laughs> And here it's a bit cold and chilly. <laughs> but I'm enjoying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm enjoying. And you're visiting nine cities, I believe over three weeks yes wow you're gonna have an american accent when you go home <laughs> <laughs> i hope so <laughs> so i'd like to start by asking you about your childhood can you tell us a little about where you were born and where you grew up oh my story begins in a small poor village in lower Zambezi valley in yamakati one of the main arteries in africa and i was raised from a poor family and my parents did not have enough money for me to proceed with school. So I was forced to drop out at an early age. And by that time, uh, I didn't decide to get married. I thought maybe I could have a helpful husband that could support me, uh, that could believe in me. Unfortunately, I was getting myself into fire because my husband was violent. Uh, he was abusive. He wasn't even supportive. He did not even allow me to have um, a paying job or even to go to school or even to be an independent mm -hmm. woman. So I had to stay and live in that abusive marriage for almost uh, four years. And when I have my first child, I thought maybe the abuse gonna stop, but unfortunately it continued. And I then built up courage um, with time, then I had to t tell myself that I had to stop this and prepare for my own path. 
prepare for my life, prepare for my future. That's quite a background. When, when you were a younger person, just to step back a little bit, were you aware of any conservation efforts or incidents of poaching within your local community? When I was growing up, I wasn't even aware of the conservation. Uh, I can say my father was a ranger. He was uh, a food protector, a conservationist. But when I was growing up, I couldn't understand the meaning of his job. I couldn't even understand what he was doing. He got a kind heart that to an extent when he, like when he sees sort of like a small bug or even an ant uh, like struggling in a bucket full of water, he could just, that's what I still remember. Uh, he could go and rescue it and just take it out to let it go. By that time when I was growing up, I couldn't understand the meaning of that. But now because I'm into it. I mean, in the industry of conservation, I'm now realizing what he was doing. Unfortunately, when I get divorced, then we, that, that's when he passed on. So he couldn't uh, witness uh, the job that I'm doing today. But I, I believe he is with me. Now he'll be very proud for sure. Yes. Yeah. So we're just gonna stop very quickly just to show a quick video. All right. Just to set the stage. So, uh, Sammy, whenever you're ready, please. The people are connected to the planet, and the planet needs us to be taking care of it. So the connection with the wildlife, the nature, the planet is uh, on us because we are the ones who can take action. The Akashinga model is unique in a, in a number of ways. Uh, I think one of them is um, the selection of uh, the areas that we go into. So we really focus on areas that don't have the resources at this moment to be managed. These areas are often also the link between officially protected areas and form important corridors. Uh, so the, the challenges that, that women face in conservation the cultural aspect of women not being um, traditionally seen as leaders. I think in conservation we need a couple of things to succeed in the future. So one of them is integrity, we need empathy and we need strength. And I think looking at the female rangers and how they do their work, they embody those, those values. Yeah, the job is helping me so much. I have a kid, I have the family, and I'm uh, trying to correct those things that was not uh, done for us since we were growing up. So for a person like me who is now having, it's something that I can say it's an achievement for me. With communities um, in areas where we operate out of, without their cooperation, we cannot grow. They are actually the custodians uh, of the wildlife that we're trying to protect. We protect this wildlife and natural resources on their behalf. For them to see the benefits that cascade out of uh, the work we do uh, conserving the wildlife, so that if they see a direct benefit from the work we do, then they've got a bigger appreciation of how important wildlife is. Now, in terms of looking at our landscape, our landscape is a wide ecosystem that goes across a country or across multiple countries. And if they can't find a way to generate an income, those areas will be lost. Where women have rebuilt the bridge between conservation and communities and where a small group of, of women have achieved what very few armies or police forces uh, in history have done, and that is win the hearts and minds of a local community. And hearts and minds in terms of protecting such large areas uh, is where it's at. So, you know, it's very humbling to be part of the team. You know, I'm extremely proud of, of everyone there's something far more powerful than biceps and bullets, um, and that's relationships. Excellent, thank you. So you were part of the first cohort of Akashinga Rangers in 2017. Yes. So, uh, in fact, you're one of the first 16 female Rangers. Can, can you tell us what led 
to you joining Akashinga and becoming a ranger? When Akashinga was introduced uh, in our area in 2017, my life was tough and it was difficult. Everything was upside down to me. And when our founder, Jamin Menda, came into the area, um, go to the um, local leaders, and he told them about the initiative of employing females as rangers. And the local leaders have to spread the word, uh, the message to us. And it was an open door to every woman who wants to try and who want to join. So that's when I heard about that incredible opportunity that presented itself to me since my life was tough, everything wasn't going in the right way. So by that time, I had to grab that opportunity without fail. Mm. And to be honest and frank with you, the training was tough. It was hard. Yeah, it, I can say almost 100 women came uh, for the recruitment to try. And by that time, Damien only won 16. And I'm very proud that through, through the training selection, I managed to be part of the uh, first cohort. That's the first 16 uh, Akashinga Rangers. And during the training, we had to do 50 push-ups in two minutes. <laughs> Can you do that? <laughs> even myself, in the first two days, first three days, I couldn't even make up to 10. <laughs> but I had to push through. And I, we had to push through, encourage each other, and uh, as a team, as family, as sisters. And finally, we managed to graduate as rangers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so at, at the time, it was considered to be kind of a male-dominated role, being a ranger. Yep. Do you think it was a crazy idea when you were applying? Yeah, to the community, mm -hmm. even to our family members. It was sort of like, it was sounding crazy because it was a male-dominated space. Everyone was just knowing a ranger is a man. And that was the biggest or the greatest challenge that we had faced in the first beginnings after we have graduated, that the community misconception, they couldn't believe that female can be rangers. And men, they thought that we are taking over their duties. They were mocking at us, they were saying bad things about us, draining energy from us, but we didn't quit. <laughs> Excellent. So can you tell us more about the women who applied who have applied and continue to apply to Akashinga. Mm -hmm. What kind of backgrounds do they come from? Have they had any experience in this kind of work before? Or are they, are they like yourself? All the rangers, all the female rangers in Akashinga organization, they don't have a um, background of conservation. But they have gone through tough situations. They have experienced uh, tough life. Exp they have experienced tough life. Life. They have from abusive marriage, like myself, mm -hmm. uh, sexual harassment, and some of them they are orphans. Some of them they are school dropouts. So that's most of the backgrounds of the Akashinga Rangers. Yeah. So you spoke before about, you touched on it briefly about kind of the perception of the community. Yep. How has your relationship with your community changed as, as you've become a ranger? I can say that in the first three months when we started working in the field, we have managed to make uh, 191 arrests. And that was a very big impact and it contributed to 80% uh, reduction of poaching in Lower South Zambia's Valley. Mm -hmm. And because of those achievements that we have made in the first early days, it proves to the community mm -hmm. that we can make it, we can be game changers, we can do something as women. So the relationship started to, to change. They started to support us because 
they were seeing the the achievements we in the successes we we were making and also because of our presence the wildlife population started to increase the area that we started to operate in was a trophy hunting area mm-hmm. where, where was the area uh in hurungwe safaris e, yes in lower sambes valley it was a trophy hunting area yeah. so when we started to operate in that area animals started to come in back yes and they started to feel safe and the community started to witness the presence of the animals so that was also a very big impact to the community which brought them to be in the same pipe with us and support us the way that we do so so before akashiga began in that region apparently i understand the poaching networks are quite prevalent can you give us more background on the kind of intelligence network and activities that you, with your colleagues, engaged in? How did you? How were you able to begin to dismantle these poaching networks? Yeah, when we started working in that area, it has a history of uh, eight thousand uh, elephants that have been poached prior to the uh, uh, prior to Akashinga, and we started to uh, build an intelligence network so that we can. We have the information of the of the poachers, and we have a group of uh, uh, what we call community guidance. Those colleagues they stay within the community, and we rangers we work in the field. Mm-hmm. So whenever we miss a poacher in the in the bush, we get the information from the from our colleagues who stay in the bush. So we don't have any poacher that we miss. So at the end of the day. Once a poacher decided to to kill animals, we ended up arrest him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And so when you uh, when you arrest them, mm-hmm. uh, how do you de-escalate dangerous situations? There must be times where you come across men who have guns who are prepared to kill animals. Yeah. You know how do you de-escalate that situation? I can say women are mothers by nature, and mm-hmm. we are also teachers by nature. And uh, we can de-escalate that tension by like the nurturing thing that that we do to our kids. We can also do it to to our animals. So I can say, when we go to the community, we do educational awareness, educating them. So what I can say, what makes uh, Akashinga Rangers more effective is we don't fight against poachers, but we make them uh, to feel being involved. I can say we put the community at the heart of the organization. In whatever conservation efforts that we do, we make sure that the community benefits. And we make sure that they, their voices are heard, mm-hmm. yes, in some other incidents. And also, we do the conservation clubs to the schools. So we are trying to catch them young the upcoming generation and also we know that when a child is taught something at school when he or she goes back home you tell his dad or his mom that i learned about elephants i learned about the dangers of poaching so all those uh, uh, methods that we use are quite different to the ones that we've been used by male uh, before we started to work here and what do you think? What is the perception of men like when they realise that it's a group of ladies? You, mm. you turn up to arrest them. What? How do they respond to you? Yeah, in the first uh, beginnings, they were <laughs> 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 they they were like they couldn't believe that we can arrest them, but because we have managed to arrest them, mm-hmm. they started ah uh, realizing they started realizing that women can can do this job and also they started to render us respect because like to those who have been through abusive marriages like myself I'm now independent uh, uh, I'm no longer being exploited yes when I get paid first thing I think of my family and I get back home 
I pay school fees for my family. I, I buy food for my family. I have time with my family and also even supporting the community. So with all those things, they started to, to respect us. And also in the first beginnings, uh, after the initiative of the Akashinga Rangers, we have received reports from the nearest police stations that the rape cases re were reduced. So that was a greatest sign that men started to pay us respect mm -hmm. because we are now employed and we are now empowered. Yeah, that's amazing. And so, as part of your training, you don't you're not trained to shoot to kill. You if you have to shoot, you'll shoot to injure. Yes. Could you tell us a little bit more about that training process and how how that is in practice for you? Like if someone if you go to arrest a poacher and they run away, what do you, what do you do? Most of our arrests that we do, uh, we do through raiding. Raiding, yes. So whenever we miss a poacher through the intelligence network, mm -hmm. we plan for a raid during the night when everyone is asleep. <laughs> <laughs> then we, we hit the house. So that makes us easier mm -hmm. and makes us to avoid uh, shooting off to people. Mm -hmm. Yes. So you just, uh, I saw it on one of the the National Geographic video where you, you go into a guy's house. And yes, you sleep yes, and you, yes. You wake him up and arrest him. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and how many of your, have any of your fellow rangers been killed in the line of duty? Wow. None. And None. How, how about poachers? None. That's incredible. Yes, we haven't have any record of that. Mm-hmm. And, you know, considering how dangerous your work is, you know, in, the, in all the time that Akashing has been operational, you've never had anyone killed no. on your side, on the other side. I think that's testimony to the incredible work you guys are doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And your approach. So when uh, when you've arrested a poacher, what happens next? What is, is it a process of rehabilitation? What, what does that process look like? Yes. We rehabilitate the, the poachers by creating employment for them. So there's another method that, that is helping us to reduce poaching. So once we arrest a poacher and we go, and we go with, to, with him to the police and through the court of justice, and once he is sentenced and saved the sentence, when he come back, he is created a job. So after the job creation, he's no longer going back to the to the protected area to kill the animals. So right now, we have rehabilitated uh, uh, most of the poachers within the area. And those poachers have been, they are now uh, participating in the intelligence network mm -hmm. of providing us information <laughs> of what is happening and what is being planned by other poachers we have not yet arrested. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, and and are you experiencing more, uh, many repeat offenders or are you finding that not many people repeat, so, go back to poaching? So the people you arrest, do they, do they go through the process of being prosecuted and then yes. go back to be poachers or is that very rare? It's very rare. Uh, at first, they were going back again to do the mm -hmm. poaching. Yeah. But that's when we realized that there is need for rehabilitation. And it's really working. Okay. In in recent years, there's been a focus on the challenges presented by the concept of fortress conservation. Mm -hmm. uh, how does Akashinga balance the need to stop poaching whilst the communities may want the freedom to hunt on a subsistence basis? Yeah, I can say that Akashinga is um, supporting the community in different ways because in our area, we have got subsistence farmers, so subsistence uh, poachers who just go to poach so that they can sustain their families. So Akashinga is uh, providing with some projects so that those poachers have something to do within the community. So Akashinga is, excuse me, is providing with clean water so that they can do some green. Uh, green gardens, growing vegetables, and sell them to the markets. And also even uh, infrastructure development and building some schools and clinics 
So during all those uh, developments, there's creation of employment. And also right now, Akashinga is bridging a gap of school dropouts. Because some of the poachers were school dropouts. They didn't have anything to do in their life. So it is building some schools and sponsoring uh, scholarships to students. Almost 200 students right now are being sponsored by Akashinga in our community. So it is bridging the gap of creating more poachers within the area. Mm -hmm. Because the more a person is educated, the more sometimes is or he she is brainstormed and at the end of the day he got a work to do and find something to do other than just being jobless and just stay at home at the end of the day the only thing you think of is to go into the protected area and find something to kill so I, I understand your organization was not always called Akashenga can you take us through the meaning of your new name and how it came about to change? Our organization in the beginning, when it was started in 2009, was called International Anti-Poaching Foundation. And when it came up with an initiative of employing all female rangers in 2017, that's when the name Akashinga came. And it came through as the first skating rangers. So during our training, we were told to brainstorm ourselves and think of something or think of a word that describes ourselves as female rangers. Mm -hmm. So like what I mentioned before that the training was tough, it was hard. We come up with that word, akashinga. We call ourselves the Akashingas, meaning the brave ones in our common language in Zimbabwe. So that's where it started. It started as the name of the, of the group of the female rangers. Then now it is the name of the organization. Excellent. And, and so what was that, the process for Damien if he, when he was given up the old name of the company? How, how how did it come about that you wanted to change the name? So. There was inclusion of, uh, what I can say, there was inclusion of all employees. Mm -hmm. The idea was spread to every employee within the organization and the employees, we had to participate, contributing, buying on the idea. So it, it didn't even, it did not even just think, uh, alone does I, I today i want to change the name of the organization mm -hmm. wow he considered the rangers he considered all personnel within the organization mm -hmm. and their contribution then at the end of the day it come up like that that's amazing so we saw some very powerful imagery in the video and, and heard a bit about the importance of akashinga's work mm -hmm. and focus on key landscape corridors Often we hear about conservation efforts for specific species or groups of species. Mm -hmm. Can you share how Akashinga approaches conservation on a landscape scale and what that entails? Right now, Akashinga, when it started to uh, employ all female rangers, it was just Zimbabwe. That's where I'm based. Then it stretches to Mozambique, Botswana, Namibia, and Kenya. So right now it is covering uh, 13 million acres. That's the landscape we are protecting in those five countries. So we are looking forward to protect or to cover 7 million acres, 7 million hectares, I mean, sorry, 7 million hectares by the end of the decade. That's incredible. And so what about these, uh, the importance of biological corridors and mm -hmm. being able to allow animals to move between different uh, protected areas? Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about the efforts to restore those corridors and protect them? 
Yes, it's very important to restore those uh, corridors and also maintaining them. I can give an example of elephants. They use the <coughs> same corridors. And I can also give an example of the area that we are operating in. Before we came in, it was an abandoned area. Everyone was just doing everything that she deemed to do at any day, at any time. There was a lot of deforestation that was happening within the area. So we are reforestating the area. And last year, uh, I have established a tree, indigenous tree plant nursery. And I managed to transplant 1,000 trees within the area. And right now, as I'm speaking, we've got 10,000 uh, seedlings within the uh, tree uh, plant nursery. We are uh, expecting to transplant, uh, reforestating the, the area. When we understand that by reforestating the area, we are creating habitat for other animals, not just um, maintaining the corridors of the animals that were disturbed, but also creating the habitat and also the food for the animals. And we also uh, target to uh, supply those trees to the community again so that they can reforest their communities. Because the push factor that drives them to go into the protected area and deforest the area is there are no longer trees in their, in their, ho in their homes. There are no longer trees in their areas. So it's now our duty as conservationists in the area to spread the word and also support them and assist them to reforest their areas. And also let them understand that they can coexist with the, the, with the wildlife. Because before those people uh, stay in, the, in their areas, the animals were just crossing and it, it were their corridors before they, they were there. And now, because there are humans present in that area, doesn't stop the animal to cross through those areas, especially the elephants. And also even any, any, any animal, we cannot even uh, stop it or to say like what we do to our children, don't, don't go this side. <laughs> so it can go anywhere at any time. Mm -hmm. So right now is Akashinga, we are educating the community so that it can coexist with the with the wildlife. Like we have a community that is bordering the protected area. So, so there is no way animals cannot get out from the protected <coughs> areas and go to the to the community. And there is crop raiding happening, livestock predation. So we are helping them to find out and to come up with mitigation measures for those human wildlife conflicts. And also we are trying to involve them, mm -hmm. like buying their traditional knowledge in the mitigation measures. Like for example, we are making some chili bricks to uh, get rid of the elephants. So what we do is we mix the chili powder, elephant dung, and use the oil. Then we mold into bricks and we dry those bricks in two weeks they will be done so we provide to the community and they light them they don't prov uh, produce a flame but they just produce some sm smoke so the smell of that irritates the elephants mm -hmm. wow. so before these uh, community people were just burning the elephant dung that's their traditional knowledge that if you burn uh, the elephant dung, the elephant doesn't want its, uh, the, the smell of its dung, so it will go away. So we come in and introduce to them that chilies also irritates the, the elephants. So we join hands together with them, bringing the, ele the elephant dung that they used to know and also the chili, the chilies, and they used to oil. Then we work together and fight for the elephant mm -hmm. conflict. And so, one of the greatest threats um, for uh, reforestation efforts can sometimes be communities uh, looking for firewood to cook with. 
So what what do you do about that? Do you have, do you offer any alternative sources of fuel for cooking? Yes. For now, we are not just we are not uh, providing uh, sort of like altern alternatives. Their uh, areas is not totally cleared, but there are some uh, trees that are left. Mm. So we provide them an idea of um, making what we call toto stores. So those stores they can build uh, using bricks in a way that they can just use small chopped. Uh, Small chopped firewood, and that um, uh, that that stuff that is being built by the by the brick, it uh, retain the heat for quite long time, so it means less firewood. You see, mm -hmm. and also sometimes we give them a time opportunity to look for firewood, not cutting trees, not cutting live trees, but to just collect the the, the 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 trees that have dead already. So you mentioned before that you're working across 11 million acres in in four countries. Mm -hmm. uh, how complex uh, is it to expand the Akashingo model across those regions? Kind of what are the biggest challenges you feel that you face in achieving that? Right now, I can I cannot say it's. Uh, the complexity comes like with different cultures. Like in Zimbabwe, in Mozambique, Botswana, and Namibia, they are quite different. So the time it took for them to buy that idea of conservation differs. But I'm happy that at the end of the day, they get to understand that we are not there to fight. Like. In Zimbabwe, at first, they thought that these rangers, they have come to fight with us because we were stopping them to kill animals for them to have meat. So they, they were thinking like we are becoming enemies of which we were sisters from the, from the community. Mm -hmm. So they were taking us as enemies because they didn't understand the concept. But now because they realize what we are doing, they realize the importance of conservation. They are buying it. And also, because m most of the women who are vulnerable, they are jobless. So if Akashinga come and say, we want to empower women, we want to employ women, people will be very happy. And they will be easily buy that idea of empowering a girl child. Yeah. Okay. So moving on to on, from a personal level, um, as, as a biodiversity supervisor, I'd like to talk about your experiences with mentorship and the role that plays in cultivating others' success and, and advancing leaders. Uh, reflecting to my journey in Akashinga, I just started as a ranger and progressing with my career, I was then promoted to become a sergeant in 2020 and started leading the Akashinga team and also when I I won an award for the IUCN International uh, Female being the first female in 2020, 2022 and also finally promoted to the position that I'm holding today as a biodiversity supervisor I can see myself inspiring my colleagues, my community, and also some other women around the world. Because I can see that with determination and support, remarkable achievements are possible regardless of your own beginnings. Because my background was messed up. It was tough. I couldn't believe that one day I could be in America like today. Mm -hmm. because, <laughs> but because of the support that I received from Akashinga from the way I started with Akashinga up to now now I'm today I'm here today so I always encourage my colleagues that you have to be determined and you have to keep focused in whatever you are doing and you have to be strong sometimes 
the training was tough if i wasn't strong i could just surrender and quit and go back home and i could be never nyarazo i am today mm-hmm. so i always encourage my colleagues and also some other girls in schools that they have to be determined and with the support like it akashinga we work as a team we support each other no one is allowed to left behind and now i can say the first christian uh court they are no longer rangers every one of us is in leadership role some are now instructors when we started being tr- we were being trained by men but now it's a different story we have a training academy at our station and that training academy is now being run by women wow. women are now training other women to be rangers mm-hmm. and also some are now managers operational managers receive managers and so with that we are inspiring the upcoming generation and also our our little sisters and also even the students from different schools that women can be leaders women can be leaders not just leaders but leaders in conservation and we believe we can bring a change to the world not just uh in zimbabwe mm-hmm. but to the whole world brilliant so this is the leads to the next question how do you think female rangers differ to male rangers what are there any qualities of being a female that makes you better suited than men at this kind of work and no pressure <laughs> <laughs> uh sometimes i always uh sometimes i first uh like <laughs> say women are less corrupt mm-hmm. as compared to to men we are not easily bribed mm-hmm. and that's the true fact so that also makes us unique as compared to to male rangers and also women we are mothers mm mm-hmm. first thing that i think of when i get paid is my family my kids as compared to men sometimes in the rurals when they get paid they went through the night clubs <laughs> and they got drunk and after maybe they sleep over at that night club they then they will go home tomorrow after spending some money mm-hmm. but what i do is i go straight back home and spend my money with my family with my kids mm. and that money goes back to the community so right now with the empowerment of local women from akashinga it has supported the development of the community since most of the money is going back to the community circulating in the community we buy from the local shops in the community so you see how important it is and also women are teachers by nature mm-hmm. we are easily heard when we start to say something to we don't say something in harsh way like women men they they want to be feel like they have got power mm-hmm. <laughs> but our power as women is in words and the the approach that we do to the to the to the men to the poachers i mean or even to the community and we are mothers so the love that i give to my kids is also the love that i give to to my to the animals i can say to my animals mm-hmm. because they are just like my kids so if i take the animals as my kids there's no way i will become bribed i will be bribed by the poachers mm-hmm. to give me 100 dollars so that they can, they can kill an elephant because i will feel like it's just more like my daughter so that's 
the most thing that makes us to be unique and we believe that we don't have to fight with poachers but we have to create peace between us and the poachers and we believe that sometimes they do that out of ignorance not knowing that they are causing a lot to the ecosystem not that not just to the animals but also to the ecosystem so if we arrest those poachers we take it as an advantage to educate the poacher so that when he did not know what is it to be a conservationist what is it, is it to not to kill the animals now he gets to know okay. just one last question for me before we go to the audience but can you give us any examples of any memorable or emotional interactions you've had with wildlife that you could share <laughs> When I was growing up, I didn't have that passion on animals. And I started to have that love, much love on animals when I was working as a ranger. And one day during the patrol, we encountered um, a pangolin, of which, yeah, it was so sweet. <laughs> and I can say that, we had to call our colleagues at the station that we have seen uh, a colleague, we are with it right now, and nobody could believe us. And to us, it was like something, how best can we tell them? There was little um, network coverage, we couldn't even send them pictures on phone. What we have is just a radio call. So it was something like, oh my goodness, and the pangolins are very rare to be seen within the protected area. And we also consider it um, be a f lucky person mm -hmm. if you see a pangolin. <laughs> so we had to finish our patrol, but our hearts were not settled because our colleagues couldn't believe us that we have seen a pangolin. They were, thought, they were thinking that we, we were lying to them. Then when we get back, the only thing that we we have done is to show them pictures. We didn't say any word, but we just to show them pictures of the pangolins on the and everyone was happy because we didn't know that we have got pangolins within the area of which it, it is an endangered species. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that time I think that's when I started to develop the strong passion on animals because when I was growing up, seeing my dad uh, as a ranger, I couldn't believe and I couldn't understand the meaning of it. Mm -hmm. But when I started to witness the existence of the little animals within the protected areas, that when I started to have that strong connection on mm -hmm. animals. Yeah. And right now, a pangolin is one of my favorite animal. <laughs> <laughs> That's beautiful. And when, when we spoke the other day, you mentioned about a young lion that you came across one time that it was caught in a snare. Could you tell us about that, please? Oh, yes. There's another incident also. In the early days, during on our patrols, we came, uh, we came across with um, a lion that was trapped with a wire snare on its hind leg, and it was struggling to, to walk and that lion was in pain. So with the assistance of the national parks, because we, we work hand in hand with the uh, government uh, stakeholders that do conservation mm -hmm. within our area. So we had to call a veterinarian so that he can touch the animal so that we can remove the, 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 the snare. And it happened and we rescued the, the elephant. We removed the, the snare and At that time, we were very happy that we have managed to save the life of the juvenile lion. It was not that big, it was a juvenile boy. So we were very happy and it was a very big achievement. And also, that also bring a connection to, to the animals. And we started realizing that 
everything worth living. Mm -hmm. Despite it's an animal, despite it, it's a dangerous animal. The pain that we see on it, it shows us animals have got the right to live. And they don't have the right of cruelty on them. Mm -hmm. Because it was something that was not that was terrible that was on, on it and for that success that we have made we came up to give it a name <laughs> and we call it tariro in our common language which which means hope so we hear the hope that it will survive despite of the pain despite of the wound it will survive and we also you have the hope that will save more lives in the world, mm -hmm. despite this little lion. And we came up to name also the road <laughs> in, in the protected area. On the map right now, it is called Tariro. Mm -hmm. So we have the hope that we will save more lives, not just in Zimbabwe, but oh, also... It yes, it did. Yes, it did survive. And it should also be mentioned as well that not only is, is Akashing it's led by female rangers, but you're all vegan as well. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so there are a lot of things that make uh, makes us unique. <laughs> <laughs> we are we are also vegans. When I was growing up, I wasn't a vegan. Then I started being a vegan when I joined Akashinga. And it was difficult. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> But now, I am, yeah, <laughs> we, are, we are vegans, so we don't believe in killing, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So that's the other thing now <coughs> that the community at first didn't understand. They thought maybe if there is a problem animal that goes into the community, they will just call us, then we go with our guns and shoot it. Mm -hmm. But surprisingly, we just go there and scare the animals back into the into the protected area because we don't kill. So at first they didn't understand that aspect, but now we are in the same pipe. Yeah. yeah. Sergeant Howard, on behalf of the Commonwealth Club World Affairs, uh, I wish to thank you for the extremely important work you and your organisation are doing, and thanking. I want to thank you for helping us maintain our tradition of hosting enlightening conversations for 121 years. Thank you. Thank you so much.